Not since the shocking results of the Calcutta volleyball incident of 1920 have the results of the change in a game been so important to the world. Can you remove the real-time combat from the Yakuza games and still find the magic they had? In Yakuza Like a Dragon, you play Ichiban, a dejected Thundercat, after 17 years in prison. He returns to join up with a homeless man, a DMV worker, and a couple other people to take on the ruling class of the Yakuza, who pretend they aren't the ruling class, but then remind you throughout all of the game that, you know, they rule pretty much everything. Real-time crazy-ass combat and open worlds have been the straight-up juice. For Yakuza, one second treating someone to a 28-spoke lunch by jamming a parked redline bicycle into their face, the next tossing somebody crotch first into a light post to see if alternating and direct current power can be generated by momentum delivered via nutsack. All the while, the games continually delivered comedic-styled overtones across a serious story. And speaking of serious, I'm playing the serious version, which is the Xbox Series X. This will come out in the next couple days, and if you like the video, maybe subscribe. Graphics are up first. The most important question and answer we get is what would a giant Japanese dude look like in a baby diaper that comes in a size that just simply says bigger than Brock Lesnar on the front? Boom, we get it. Like a Dragon actually has some competition from a couple of its previous games in the series though, as those titles really up the graphical fidelity that was offered. Character wise, the game may not be the strongest though, we'll get to that in a second. It looks damn good though, most of the time, whether you're running around in the game's third person mode or just silently walking down alleys in the first person view. While there are some stunning low details textures in some of the stores from a distance that you normally play the game. It looks great with a smattering of the effects that the later games and remakes have been known for. Now, if you're one of those people that watches videos where they zoom in 8,000 times a detail, like they're trying to find a pockmark on an astronaut's ass on the moon, you will notice those low detail textures in some places. A normal gamer, probably not. The highlight is, and always will be though, these goofy ass animations that the game throws at you here in the turn-based timing. The first time you enter a battle after choosing the dancer job for Ichiban, it's hard not to laugh as his hip-hop shuffle sort of breaks into the beginning of the battle itself. When he 720 spins off a dude's dome for the last hit, the game slows down and that animation just keeps playing. It is actually really goddamned classic in that feeling and the styling. And while other places may not hold up as well, the animations here in the combat moves do. From calling in mob bosses to monsters to boxers for special moves during battles to the dance that one of your characters does during her turn if you pick the pop idol job, it's all done very well and to a detail level I don't think a lot of people expect. And it's not always just in the detail of a character that enlightens us to what's going on, but sometimes it's just their emotiveness and here their animation like Ichiban who always looks like his face was punched in and then it was frozen in time. He consistently offers this refreshing feeling to the game and while obviously not offering that stoic man in a comic book that the original game's main character did, he has his own place. That moment when there's a celebration when passing mental tests at the Scientology-like school for the less than gifted to his consistent discussing of Dragon Quest to anybody who will listen. He's more emotive, and while the jury will be out for gamers who will embrace him, I dug the shit out of him and his team. Lighting in these engines has always been one of the places that Yakuza has immersed us in the atmosphere of the locales, sprinting down the back alley behind some place selling contentiously dated sushi, and seeing that debris and detritus of the world around you that's sort of stocked up and built up. That's one of the places the game works. However, it does have some graphics issues that were noticeable, like the Xbox Series X and the frame rate modes. It worked without a hitch, but it was a bit blurry on farther off locations, like the depth of field was a bit too aggressive on the frame rate mode. Now, when the resolution mode was turned on, it was absolutely fixed and it offers a native, at least from my counting of the pixels resolution. It wasn't always a solid FPS. There were a couple glitches here and there. Loading times between the sections are very fast, as is one of the selling points of the new consoles. Reading even one or two of the hints and suggestions during loading was almost impossible before the game was up and running in the next spot. This was noticeably slower even on the Xbox X. Regardless of which version you play and at what graphical setting, where Dragon excels is that ability to see the combat a bit more clearly than ever before and really revel in what is some emotive and almost essential animation to get the story across for a lot of these characters and that team building that you actually do. It was incredible to see them all come together and sort of battle as one a little more slowly so you could see that actually occur versus the real-time combat we got in the prior games. And it may be different. It may take a little bit of getting used to, but I actually found it to be quite refreshing. And that brings us to sound, music, and voice. Well, it would be 
piss me off to allow that slick fuck the last laugh. All right, then there's no time to waste. Off to restaurant row. Unfortunately, I also have to be discreet about who receives my business card. <laughs> wow. Are you even allowed out this late? At a place like this? There's always something important about these weaving together. For example, there was an excellent attention to detail with the light pattern clack of the J-pop jobs heels on the ground as she danced. However, samples for a lot of things, including guns, are just terrible. Like, I get it, it's not supposed to be real or sound real, it's a game, but it's supposed to actively not sound fake. The sound effects environmentally were okay when you're in the cities, but a lot of the extra stuff, not so good. And when it comes to music, it was sort of the same way. They're more subdued than I thought when it comes to the tracks. When it was up and playing, there were a couple battle tracks I really liked, but a good amount of the game had the characters sitting back and talking for long periods of time and not a lot of instrumental accompaniment, which would have raised that emotional connection to me a bit. And that's also mimicked in their voice my attitude on this has changed many times throughout the game. I don't understand Japanese, so playing a game with that as the main voice does nothing for me. I know that's like some kind of atrocious, unforgivable sin to some gamers, but seriously, fuck you, I don't care. It doesn't work for me. Sometimes, the English voices, yeah, they didn't work that well either. I normally have no issues with dubs when it comes to grammar and delivery, but some of the English voices here leave a lot to be desired over the full 35 hours. And while I didn't mind Ichiban and a couple others, it's especially noticeable when highly trained voice actors get in areas that are rough as hell with some others. And the game's not a short game, and those cutscenes are not short either. So getting all that matched together didn't really work so well. And that's going to feed into your story, and that's going to impact it, and that's also going to bring us to gameplay. Now, if this character doesn't have the friggin' circle of life, I don't know who does. Yakuza introduces us, this time, the first prime game change in character with Ichiban, son of horse. I wouldn't call him that. I don't think anyone would, but that's pretty much what happened. Ichiban's mom was a soap land employee and all that splattering somehow got herself pregnant. But then she decided, you know what, it's probably too difficult to have a child, so I'm just going to leave the town and drop the kid off in a locker. And she left him. So like every Disney movie character ever, he's adopted by gold-hearted prostitutes. He grows up as an angsty child, which really isn't all that puzzling, and ends up joining the Yakuza. Feeling like he owes a debt to the family of the Yakuza that adopted him, he then takes a fall for a murder he didn't even commit and is promptly sent to jail <laughs> for 17 years. Yeah, he's not the smartest dude in the box, that's for sure. The game proper starts back with Ichiban returning home. Now, I want to make this clear. I said game proper for a reason because Like a Dragon has no problem, just like its predecessors, but more noticeable here to keep that player sort of at the beck and call of the story, sitting through insanely long story elements that can stretch easily over 10 minutes, even for the short ones. So be prepared because this also means the starting of the game, there can be a good deal of time without a fight. This is like an older style turn-based game in the way that it sort of has a lackadaisical respect for your time. But once you get going, it's a back and forth from the current time to flashback of Ichiban trying to figure out how the world works after 17 years fighting off lovers in jail showers. As you begin the game, you start to unlock the main missions, gathering a couple friends in battle with you. Like most Yakuza games, many systems unlock slowly throughout the title. You will go a while before the new job system, for instance, is introduced. Once it is, you can change out the jobs that each character levels up with, and each each job has its own moves completely, from your normal battle animations to combat moves to special moves. It's all different with each one of them donning a costume during battles that also benefits the character. That is actually different from the various different clothing that you get that you put on and you equip throughout the game, which actually is not reflected throughout the game at any time, which is a little bit weird for a lot of people playing. You'll have your major suit that involves the job itself, and then you'll have clothing that you actually put on that, well, you're just putting it on. It really doesn't do anything else other than adjust your statistics. So some of these different jobs have to be unlocked in special ways. Some have to be unlocked via main stories and others by completely side stories. Regardless of what you're outfitted in, Like a Dragon utilizes the same come at me bitch combat system, or CAM for short. It means if you see characters on the screen, you can try to take them out or you can try to run around them, but they have a vision cone and you either will need to get out of there quickly or turn to face them on. And from there on, it's battle time. Each one of you chooses the move that you do and the round orientation is based on the dexterity the characters have. And with all the characters moving around at any time when you're choosing, this is one of the best parts of the battle systems, as enemies can interrupt you if you try to run past them to take out one of their friends. So sometimes you have to wait or switch moves to something else. I can see it being bothersome to a lot of gamers who have a very particular way of playing and want to minimax everything, but sometimes I like to shoot the gap and see what would happen and take a risk. You can choose normal attacks, doing damage with whatever weapon that you actually carry, items from your inventory add to that. You can do guards, which up your defensive amount a great deal for the next attack. 
back, you can choose items from your inventory to use, and you have your special moves that revolve around the job. Now, special moves, they're like your basic magic system with each move costing a number of different points to pull off and all requiring timed button presses to get the most out of them. It's all tied into the various different characters and their jobs that they can get with some overlap on a couple of the characters, depending on sex, which well, not sex, the sex of the character. You actually don't get to have sex in the game, sadly enough. This also feeds into the one of the more unique systems in Dragon. You can tell the team to fight automatically during battle, safely, smartly, and very aggressive, I think. Now, this causes them to choose moves from their requisite move list, but you can still have to do the QTEs. I dig this because to me to keep engaged, sometimes with some of that busy work turned off, I felt like I could sort of sit back and just watch my Revlon enhanced ray trace spiky haired protagonist pound somebody into a dirt burger on the ground. And hey, you know what? Somebody else is wearing underwear holding a pool airbed, so I got to do a QTE to dance out of the way. Depending on the jobs and the moves that they have, the interactions between them can also be enhanced. For instance, some of the musicians' moves do more damage if you have other characters who have chosen that like-minded job. In many games, there's this furiosity when it comes to the combat, and in a lot of games, there is no comedic elements. Here, the comedic element fits into the combat itself. In Yakuza, a normal day is when a one-eyed country guitarist, a J-pop singer, a construction worker, and an ex-Yakuza dude beat the shit out of someone over a can of soup. That's Yakuza in a nutshell. That's just one battle. Beating enemies gets you points for both your level and the level of a job itself, as well as items. And... In comes the grindy parts for a bit. Now, when you die, you restart with half of your money removed. Sadly, that's not the grinding part I want to talk about. First, the game throws a dungeon at you about halfway through the title, and it is atrocious. It's long, it's boring, it has repeated rooms over and over and over. It's also the main place you grind both then and later in the game when you need some levels between some of the story missions. Now, you can do some of the side missions for sure, but some of the items and special things that you can get in there are going to help you craft better weapons. One of the places that you can unlock in the game is for that. And they're all in this fucking dungeon. I would rather eat my own head than see the door to that place again. And some gamers find dungeons the tablature of true turn-based games, the requisite attraction, recreational destination they have to go to. I get that, but come on, it's 2020. A bunch of fucking rooms with sewers filled to the brim with what looks like random bad guys just waiting for you is not fun, and it's not current. The game does very little to explain why it's like that after the first location and their really shitty way of explaining it. A little bit like when they pretended Batman's tank wasn't killing people in Arkham Knight and they were like, it's just electrocuting them. Never mind that a two-ton fucking tank just smashed them into Friday. And it does harken back to older titles where sometimes a dungeon's only difference from another was a damned wall color. And yeah, I played those. Played them, I said. I don't want to keep playing them. Luckily, speaking of places are some of the better ones you can go and explore with your friends and darts and arcades and batting practices, singing a Mario Kart style combat racer with its own characters and more. Each of the larger places specifically also offer bonuses to your attachment to the others in your group. And this is good because the game's at least 35 hours and sometimes you're going to have other characters in your party and the better your connection with everyone, the more experience that the characters currently not in your party are going to get. Not that for one or two of them though, that really matters very much because seriously, I'm not sure what's going on in the later part of this game. You get a couple who are added into the team at a later time and they feel like useless meat sacks. They barely have any story moments and don't feel at all really connected with the game where the other characters have their first introductions. They have a nice series of story moments as well. Some in-game banner. Some of the later characters feel like somebody's just stalking the main group who then steadfastly agrees to never mention their existence. I mean, never like not in the cutscenes, after the fact or anything. Dragon comes out ahead and behind in comparisons to open world games in the past, including its own series. It's larger and more active than the prior titles, but at times it feels less interactive than you might expect. And the game takes a bit longer than I would really like to get those new enemy types into position, which is something most turn-based games won't have an issue with as many are based in fictional worlds. So seeing a dragon isn't that unusual. Here, they even have to slightly throw a curve in the plot to make it all fit in and keep you actually somewhat entertained. And this may sound a bit bad, a bit hodgepodge, but it's not. The world changes a little bit once you've played a Yakuza game. It's sort of like that first time you realize Tom Cruise has a middle tooth and your world's just never the same. I like the Yakuza games. I think they offer something unique. I think they offer something that is tangible and feels different from other titles. 
And that brings me to fun factor. Now, I want to make this clear. It's going to sound like I didn't have a good time with Like a Dragon. Quite the opposite, I did. Any of the issues I have had nothing to do with that switch to turn-based combat. Just that Yakuza is known for variation. I expect more variation here in the jobs and in the enemies and the story. Since in the past, those have improved in lockstep with everything else title for title. Here, not so much. I never really got tired of traveling around and eating and leveling up by beating the various characters who'd step up to me. And their nonsensical reasons for existing didn't matter. I just smash the shit out of them. That side stuff of the Yakuza stories is bread and butter, and there's some craziness there. However, that craziness and the goofiness of the Yakuza games appeared very high from the preview, and now having played the main game proper, I can say it could have done with even more, especially as serious as the story actually gets. Like a Dragon offers a very unique flavor to the Yakuza games, and while that switch to turn-based combat seemed to be a rather risky move, I personally found that part of it excellent. I just wish it was a bit deeper when it came to the jobs you get, especially later on. There's a couple jobs that feel a little tacked on. They don't offer that awe-inspiring special move or excellent rewards of the others. They could do with a couple more unique moves. And speaking of all that, that brings us to the rating. As you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC titles, if that's the score I give it. I'm going to give this one a wait for a sale. I didn't have any real issues with this Yawk as a game, but I do think in all honesty, it's not really going to be for as many people as I think a lot of people are expecting. The turn-based combat itself, not bad at all. It's just not as deep as I would have liked. The story is actually long, varied. There's a lot going on there, but it really doesn't have the punch of the prior games. And unfortunately, story is one of the major things that this game sort of ratcheted itself into success with. That's what they wanted. And that's what we got with a lot of the prior titles, that comedic element mixed with the serious element. And here, the serious element sort of overrides it, even, let's say, in the middle to last half of the game when it sort of starts to ramp up. I think for a lot of gamers, their mileage is going to vary here on how much patience they really have with it, especially having to return to that damn dungeon. Anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Make sure you subscribe. It absolutely helps. Also, comment allows for me to know that you actually like these kind of videos. As you guys know, I have an Xbox Series X, Series S, as well as a PS5, and I'll be reviewing those. Since the company did send me those, I will be giving away the ones that I have put down for purchase myself to gamers who are subscribed, so make sure you subscribe. Also, you can follow me on Twitter to find out any times I'm giving away games or whenever a new video gets released. You can see that in the video as well as in the description. Peace out, everybody. I hope you have an excellent week.